Thank you, Johan. Um, I'd like to start by saying it's been a real pleasure to be here, and I will echo uh, Margaret's sentiments in saying that part of the pleasure, a big part of the pleasure, has been the very, the, it's been very inspirational for me to see the wonderful presentations done by the younger generation of uh, researchers. It's, it's really a great pleasure. So you'll see that the word uh, youth sits up in the title of my uh, talk, and you may be aware that there's a lot of debate around, well, how do we define youth? You can, there's a kind of people get all hot and bothered about where the youth category starts and ends, and governments have different kinds of definitions and so on. But in case you've been wondering, <clears throat> I can pretty much guarantee you that by any definition at all, I don't qualify as youth. <laughs> and in a way, I feel a little bit like a fraud. I shouldn't be here telling young people about youth. Okay, it doesn't make any sense. So I'm directing my little presentation very specifically to that younger generation of researchers in the audience here. And if, in the process of the little presentation and the discussion and so on, if I'm able to get someone a little bit interested in engaging with this as a research topic and engaging with it critically, I will feel that I've done my job, okay? So, um, over the last decade or so, and I think particularly since the um, world global financial crisis in 2008, it's become increasingly common to hear uh, African politicians and policymakers, development professionals and academics, and indeed the media, to suggest that the lack of opportunities, of employment opportunities for African young people is one of the big development challenges of our time. And indeed, that proposition was strengthened considerably in 2011 with the events of the Arab Spring. And many of you will remember that one of the explanations that was given very consistently and very strongly for the social tension that fueled the events of the Arab Spring in North Africa was the lack of employment opportunities, particularly for urban young people. So this is a really big topic. Now, there's many ways that we can justify, we as researchers, we as policymakers and so on, can justify an interest in young people's employment. Perhaps one of the most compelling is from a human rights perspective. And I'll just remind you that Article 23 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says this, and I quote, everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, and to protection against unemployment. That's a really strong mandate, I think, for a focus on employment of young people. But there's many other ways we can approach this. We can approach this from the point of view of self-actualization, i.e. that every person, young people and everybody else, has the right to be the best they can, to do what they want to do and to fulfill their potential. We can approach it from the point of food security from the point of the health of the agricultural sector. Some people get all upset and say, who are going to be the farmers of the future if the young people aren't engaged in agriculture? We can approach it from the point of view of economic growth and also from the point of view of security. Um, so it's interesting to note that many senior African politicians have learned a very particular lesson from the experience of the Arab Spring. And I just wanted to make that point by reading a little excerpt from a speech made in 2013 by John Mahama, the president of Ghana. And he said, I therefore always say that youth unemployment is a national security issue. Indeed, it is a major national security challenge. And so every country should put youth unemployment on its national security agenda. Because if plans are not rolled out to ensure that youth, that you engage the youth, then you can have a problem in terms of destabilization and social deviance. Well, I hope I've made the case there. I hope I've made the case that um, the interest in uh, youth unemployment is, is, is topical, one, and it's also highly politicized. And that, so that's, that's, there's, a, there's a lot going on, and I think that makes it a particularly interesting uh, area to think about and to do work on. You may know that it, the, 
the discussion of youth and work in Africa, there's been a very particular and strong link to agriculture. And basically the idea is that agriculture provides what I've been calling the sweet spot for youth employment. In other words, the agricultural sector, and here we're thinking quite broadly, it's not only production, but it's processing and transportation and everything else. The agricultural sector has the potential to provide very significant numbers of reasonable quality or attractive jobs. That's the basic proposition that's being made. Okay? So what I want to do in this presentation is just to explore that proposition a little bit, to lay out for you a little bit of the argumentation that underpins it, to explore certain elements of that, and to see where that leads us in terms of some potential research ideas. Okay? That's where we're going to go. So you'll uh, uh, bear with me, because I'm going to do this argument business in quite a stylized way. We don't have enough time for all the nuance, but maybe we can pick some of that up later on. So the first part of the argument starts exactly where John McDermott started uh, yesterday morning, with the problem of demography. So we know that the African population is growing. We haven't seen a, um, a population trans tra transition there yet. The population's growing overall, and there's a very large proportion of that population that's in this younger category. And that's going to continue to be the case for some years to come. And what that means, of course, is that every year there is a very large cohort, millions of young people, who enter the job market, who are looking for jobs. So this is the problem that people are facing today, tomorrow, the next day, and it's going to be a, a problem well into the future. Many of these rural people today live in, excuse me, many of these young people today live in rural areas. And I think no matter what we think about the rate of urbanization and so on, that also is going to continue to be the case. There will be large numbers of young people who live, are born and live and grow up in rural areas. Of course, another part of this argument is the importance, the continuing importance of the agricultural sector. Uh, much of the, again, even with urbanization, a large part of the population of sub-Saharan Africa continues to live in rural areas, and those people, to one degree or another, many of them engage in agriculture. And that's likely to continue to be the case, again, for some time into the future. Another part of the story is the fact that over the last 10 or 15 years, again, this was referred to yesterday, we've seen almost unprecedented levels of economic growth in sub-Saharan Africa. But interestingly, what we haven't seen is the amount of job creation that one would normally expect to see with that level of growth. So you've probably heard the term jobless growth, and that's exactly what many sub-Saharan Afri African countries have, have seen. At the same time, in a situation of jobless growth, we see relatively high levels of urbanization. And in fact, some people suggest that Sub-Saharan Africa is kind of the first example where urbanization has been decoupled from the growing, uh, a rapidly growing urban industrial type sector supporting jobs. And again, that creates all kinds of interesting dynamics. One of which is a lot of young people end up in the informal sector. And of course, I don't want to put the informal sector down, but the truth is, that a lot of people who end up in informal sector jobs, those jobs are uh, poorly paid, they're seasonal, they're often dangerous, and they don't really provide much uh, ability to accumulate capital and to, to get ahead. So it's not really a, a, a strategy for, um, for high levels of well-being. So that part of the argument is, in a way, the crisis argument. It's, it, there's a problem and it has to be dealt with. But the second part of the argument gives us a little bit of hope, okay? It, it puts out a little glimmer of hope there. And that glimmer is first based on the idea that there's a tremendous growth in the demand for food. Of course, partly related to the demand uh, to, to growing population in the world, but also related to shifts in dietary preferences. And that demand is seen at the level of national markets and regional markets and inter international markets. The second part of this argument is that, oh, Africa has unused resources. Some people call them unused, some people call them uh, misused, other people might call them partially used, but particularly land and water, to the point where you can find references to Africa being the future breadbasket of the globe. And indeed, there are examples of African small farmers who are engaging successfully in 
some high value international value chain. And you can point to those and say, aha, look at that, it is possible. You can find examples and what we need to do is to learn from those and to get more people involved. So there's come some kind of hope, hope there. But then we have to ask ourselves, well, why is it that there seems to be so much concern that African young people are turning away from agriculture? And before I go on, I go on any further, I want to say there's actually very little, little evidence to uh, say whether uh, young people are turning away from agriculture more or less than they have at any other time in the past. So it's a sense that young Africans don't want to farm, and there's little bits and pieces of studies here and there, but it's actually very hard to justify a general statement that African youth are turning away from agriculture. But what kinds of explanations are, do we find in the literature? I want to highlight uh, three chains of explanation. So the first is what I'm going to call the structural chain. And this is one that starts uh, up here in my mind, and it says, well, you know, there's problems with in the institutions, markets, land tenure, blah, blah, blah. There's problems with technology. African farmers don't have access to very good technology, or for whatever reason, they don't use it. That means that uh, productivity is low. That means that profitability is low. And that means that young people aren't interested. Okay, so there's a little chain of explanation that's there that's about the structure of agriculture. And you'll note that it's not specific to young people. That, those, those same issues would relate whether you were old, young, middle-aged, or whatever. There's a little subset to that story that focuses particularly on land. And it says there's a problem with land markets related to those traditional institutions. Land mar markets are not flexible. Okay, and also we have fragmentation, we have um, growing population. So what it means is that people cannot get access to land, and particularly young people can get, cannot get access to land, if, even if they wanted to start farming. Therefore, they lose interest. So that's the structural kind of explanation. There's another explanation that says it's about the young people themselves. And here it starts, in the, again, in the top in my mind with more education. Young people, by and large, in sub-Saharan Africa are better educated now than they've ever been. They have access to the world through their smartphones and the internet and so on. And that results in increased aspirations and expectations, what they want out of life. And that, you know, related to the fact that you can't see much for role models in the village from the farming community and the farmers aren't making much money anyhow, young people decide they want to get out of farming. There's a chain of explanation there. And there's a third chain, which relates to the one I just mentioned, which really says, well, it's not a problem of structure, and it's not a problem of aspirations. The real problem is they just don't know. They're just not aware of the great opportunities there are in the agricultural sector. And the job is, is to make them aware and to change their mindset, set them on the track, and they're off as agri-entrepreneurs. And indeed, I would suggest that that's the kind of logic that sits, I think it was Christine uh, yesterday talked about the agri-printer agri project in Nigeria. That's the kind of logic. There's opportunities there, but we have to change the mindset. We can do that through education and so on. So those are the three chains of ex explanation. And of course, you don't have to think about it very much, but you'll quickly see that there's a set of interventions associated with each of those chains of explanation. So for the structural chain, the um, kinds of interventions are, well, we, we invest in land tenure reform. We invest in agricultural research and technology development. We invest in extension. We invest in rural market development and so on. Of course, that is the rural development, agricultural development agenda for the last 40 years. There's nothing at all new there. For the young people's chain, where it's either the young people themselves or the uh, problem of awareness, you invest in changing their mindset, giving them some education, showing them the opportunities, a bit of entrepreneurial training. We heard a wonderful presentation this morning about that. Uh, technical training, credit, and so on. And again, the agri-entrepreneurs program is an example, but there are hundreds throughout Africa that are very similar. Well, I'd like to just take a little minute and reflect on some of these uh, some of this argumentation. The first point is that much of the, the discussion, the policy discourse, and indeed the research, is said, is, is, is a framed in incredibly general terms. So we talk about young people and agriculture, or young people 
in rural areas and agriculture. And to be honest, in my mind, to talk about young people is to say nothing. Young people are so diverse, uh, just like rural areas are so diverse. As long as we continue the discussion at that level, we might as well just quit talking, go home, have a cup of coffee, and forget it all. So we need an analysis that starts to break down in a very serious way what do we mean by young people. And thinking about all the different characteristics, gender, uh, ethnicity, level of education, what kind of family they come from, social networks, access to resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When we get down there, we'll start to be able to make some sense about why some people may or may not be interested, why some young people may or may not uh, be successful. And of course, we could say the same thing for rural areas. A rural area that has, is well watered with good soils that sits next to an urban market is a completely different proposition than one that's at the end of the road with no access to markets, no access to inputs, and so on. And I think you'd have a, you should have a, we should have a very different discussion about opportunities in those different kinds of areas. So we need a systematic analysis of what do rural, the diversity of rural areas, and we need to link that up to a systematic analysis and a nuanced analysis of the diversity of young people. And this is much more than disaggregated data by age. I'm, I'm suggesting we need to go well, well beyond that. I want to make a point about the structural barriers. So I suggested that the kind of uh, the, uh, the agenda to, to address the structural chain of explanation is essentially the same as the rural development and agricultural development agenda of the last 30 or 40 years. And of course, in a lot of places in sub-Saharan Africa, that's been a very, it's been very difficult to make much progress. And indeed, I think I saw some data last week that showed that uh, investment in agricultural research has basically stayed stagnant. It's not increasing. So we haven't made much progress on that agenda. And yet, that progress, the, the, the claim that agriculture is the sweet spot for youth employment is contingent on structural change. So if indeed structural change has been so hard to promote, then it's, it's really a, a, dis, a discussion about jam tomorrow. It's not that today the agricultural sector has jobs. It's that if we see such structural change, then there may be jobs there. And of course, that if and then could well be 20 or 30 or 40 years. And I think it's really important uh, to keep that in mind. I think another interesting thing to talk about is that a lot of this discussion takes place using the language of the ILO's decent jobs, so the decent jobs framework. And I want to suggest if someone said to me, well, you know, your goal ought to be to get a decent job, I'd say, go home. I don't want a decent job. I want a good job. I want a job that's going to be transformational or that's going to be promotional. And so I think we need to think much more imaginatively that policymakers don't want to, you know, I'm not going to satisfy, I'm not, and neither I'm sure are you, are going to be satisfied with a decent job, and no African young person should either. And I think there's an, what we've been calling the imagination gap, the gap between what young people imagine for their future, and we've got pretty good information about that, and it's not a, it's not a future with a short handle hoe, you know, being poor. It's a future as a professional with a job and all the kind of benefits of living in urban areas. But there's a gap between that imagined future and the imagined future that's embedded in agricultural policy and youth policy. And until we start to change, to decrease that gap, and I don't think we should decrease it by lowering the aspirations of the young people, I think we need to decrease that gap by increasing uh, the imagination and the aspirations of the policymakers. I'll just make a final point. And this is maybe someone who could think about this as a research topic. You might be aware of the discussion about policy coherence. And policy coherence normally is thought about uh, coherence uh, within the sector so that we get all the agricultural policies so they're coherent and they aren't working against each other. They're kind of more or less moving in the same direction. That's one element of it. And another element of it is across sectors. So that agricultural policy is kind of going in the same direction as trade policy and health policy and education policy. Fine. Our data that we've, we've done some work in Ghana with young people. And the data there shows that, you know, no matter what's going on in agricultural policy, in terms of future work and future employment, young people are going in a completely different direction. So there's a tremendous lack of coherence between the policy agenda and what young people are thinking about. 
And I think there's, kind of, there's, an, in, it's, there's, there's an interesting possibility to expand the idea of policy coherence. So it doesn't just in, uh, involve pol the policy sector and policy actors, but it actually involves, and it's a discussion of coherence between where policy is going and where the individuals who are going to be affected by that policy, where they see the world as well. And I think that might be a really interesting way to start to kind of square some of the circle or some of the very difficult elements of this discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jim. That was, that was really very interesting. Three extremely interesting presentations touching quite different areas, but mm -hmm. a lot of uh, commonalities there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also nice that you've identified a little bit some you know, research areas where we still need more understanding mm -hmm. and so on. Policy coherence is one mm -hmm. of my favorite mm -hmm. areas, I must say. Uh, one thing, though, I mean, you say it could be a sweet spot, but I mean, if we look at agriculture in other parts of the world, it becomes more intensive, but a lot less people really mm -hmm. involved in all that. Right. Uh, so maybe the job is more decent or even nice, but less people are involved right. overall. Right. Shouldn't we expect the same development anyway right. in Asia, Africa, and so on? Right. I agree. I, th I think, I mean, now I'm speaking totally personally, I think the idea that agriculture in Africa is the sweet spot for youth employment is pie in the sky because of that very reason. The agricultural transformation that's likely to take place mm is going to be cap more capital intensive and less labor intensive. Mm. I heard someone last week say, oh, yes, 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 but with policy, and if we do this right, we can have something new in Africa where the agricultural transformation is labor intensive. And, of course, they've said that same thing about the livestock revolution. And we've seen plenty of examples where the power of other actors and other interests mm. is such that I, I think, to me, the, the chance of a... a a different African model mm. emerging is probably pretty low. So what is, what is your suggestion? I mean, what, what do you think will happen? Or what do you think is necessary in order to make this transformation? This is a very small question. Mm -hmm. You know, make this transformation in a way that doesn't create huge social challenges in urban areas because of massive influx of, of youth and so on. Well, of course, there are, there are, some people would say there are, are already, the, those challenges are already there, mm. depending where you are and so on. I don't know. I don't have an answer for it. Clearly, growth in the non-agricultural sector is important. Yeah. You know, creating jobs that are good, that people wanted, that have stability and security and people can advance and they want to engage with, that's, that's the answer. And that's where mm. I think the policymakers and planners have just lost their imagination. Mm. They've given in to this discourse of it's all about entrepreneurship. We have to turn young people from job seekers to job creators. It's going to be a whole world of young entrepreneurs out there. Mm. I think that's bankrupt, and they need to really think much more clearly. They have to imagine an economy that provides jobs to their citizens, mm. and those have got to be good jobs, and you can't Hold, put that responsibility on the shoulders of the citizens to make their own jobs. Mm. Okay, it's excellent. So quite, you know, this can be a very provocative mm. discussion, which mm. is great. So, uh, any, any, I'm sure, yes, we have a question up there. Please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Cecilia. I'm from um, SNU here. Um, I'm wondering, I just have a little hard time to get the concrete vision in my head of what you mean. Um, what kind of jobs do you envision like as a good job in agriculture that differs from how it is today and why that would be sufficient for the young of tomorrow or the adults of tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I, I, I would, let me answer by saying I, think, I don't think it's about what a good job at agriculture is, but I would say it's what a good job is. Okay, a good job is one that pays, it's got some security, it gives you some headroom so you can kind of move up and use your talents and so on. Those are, whether, whether you're in engineering or agriculture or anything else, those are the kinds of, that, that's what people want about jobs. They, they want to feel valued, to make a contribution, and to have some security, provide for their family, build up a little stake in the economy and so on. It, but if you look at many, the, the situation that many young people who work in agriculture today or even their parents, it's not that at all. And I think that's, it's got to be at the heart of why young people don't want to engage. And I think, to me, it's pretty clear that there's a strong, given, given any other choice, 
many young people would say, I'm going to do something else. And their dreams are not in being a farmer. Mm -hmm. And until farming becomes profitable, secure, higher status, and so on, uh, that, I, don't, I don't see that that's going to change. So, so someone told me that even, I mean, even if you look here in Sweden, where there's obviously a somewhat of a challenge to attract younger people mm -hmm. to farming, um, that, as you're saying, you know, introducing all the new technologies, high techs, mm -hmm. it makes it more attractive in itself. Mm -hmm. Is that also a driver, you think? Yes, when our, our work with Ghana, we've worked with secondary school students in Ghana, and one of the things we asked them is, well, you know, what would need to change in agriculture? And, that, and, making, and making agriculture modern is, is what's seen as we want a modern job. We're part of the modern economy. I have a smartphone. You know, I'm on Facebook. I'm part of the modern world. Mm. I don't want to live like my parents. And indeed, my parents don't want me to live like they, they live. So it's kind of, it could be mechanization. It could be all mm. kinds of things. But it's somehow getting out of a very manual, low-paid, not very secure livelihood. Mm. Okay. Do you want to cost us? We have a question here. So we take the question first and then also a comment or a question, is it? First, first one there and then you also. We take two, if that is okay, Jim. Mm. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mulugeta. I'm from Ethiopia. Uh, actually, I'm not asking question, but uh, I'm very happy the issue has been raised, this issue of employment for, you, for the youth. Uh, at, at the moment, it, it, you know, in Africa, especially in a country where I come from, there was massification of uh, higher education mm -hmm. over the last probably 20, 30 years. And universities are uh, producing lots of graduates. And the economy of uh, th th this country is not really growing at a rate that the graduates are, mm. you know, the number of graduates are increasing. And that, that is, I mean, the way the issue has been addressed, I mean, at least brought to the, to the discussion, it, it is really a very good. I think this is not um, the, the problem of also the, uh, the use. The use could uh, go down to agriculture and find opportunities there, but it is related to lots of things. Mm. Um, mm. What is the land tenure? Where can you find the land? Where is the capital? Um, th there are lots of problems, and that is why, uh, you know, graduates after coming from university, if they are not employed, it is even having impact on, on the education that we are doing. Mm. Why? Because if uh, a guy graduated from the university is not finding a job, why a kid is going to school? Mm. Why? Mm. I mean, it's, it's a lot of complications. Yeah. And, and, and that is I mean, why people are migrating, and it's, it's not the problem of a single country nowadays, mm, it's a, a problem of the world. Yeah. And you. I think we have yeah. to join hands in, in, in looking for ways to, 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 to solve mm. problems. Mm. I mean. Thank you very much. No, it's interesting. I mean, just last week there was a news article here in Sweden uh, from an Indian state where they are, were actually announcing, uh, I think it was 150, what they called easy jobs, mm -hmm. basically, you know, a very low level, that 2.2 million applicants, yeah. 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 and 150 with a PhD, yeah. by the way, also. Yeah. So it's, it is a challenge, cl clearly, the whole uh, employment issue. And a final comment from Costas before I let you You'll also. be easy on me, Costas. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I think it was a fascinating <laughs> presentation. F frankly, you convinced a young person that uh, there is a, a good case to be made for research on this topic. Me, right? Uh, <laughs> I suppose in your definition. You're my <laughs> job then. <laughs> so here, you, then you, you, uh, you, you provided three explanations, but then you said that different settings can be an explanation for, you know, any mm. of the three. Mm. I mean, it's not, there is not one world. No. As there is no one youth. That mm -hmm. is, I, I just, I was going to bring the example of, um, of what our last intervention was there is a lot of educated people mm. in some cases mm. right so you educate people they get degrees and then what agriculture of course is don't consider it as an outlet for their mm. their mm. skills and energy right and so uh, these kinds of things have to be taken into consideration mm. which youth are we talking yeah. about right? mm. the youth in Greece now they cannot find mm. a job anywhere mm. given the skills that they have yeah. mm. um, and the, the, the last question is a research to what extent the data that we have now 
can go some way in providing some of the explanations that you may need along the three right. um, worlds. Right. That's the first, first part with your comment, I couldn't agree more. We have to get beyond talking about youth and young people. So hopefully in two years' mm -hmm. time, if you do Agri 4D again, and maybe there's a focus on youth and employment, the whole language should change. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the first step. The second one, what does current data tell us? I don't think it tells us very much. And I would love, if anybody knows of data sets or out there, we have, you can find in the literature bits and pieces of this district in Ethiopia or that district in Ghana, a couple, someone studied a couple schools here like what we've done. It doesn't add up to much. It's just little tiny bits. Is land a problem? Well, it may be or it may not be. Is this a problem? It may be or may not. We need somehow to to cover a more integrated and nuanced, fine textured uh, story about what's going on. And it's going to be a major, it'd be a major initiative. Thanks a lot. Good. Thank you very much. A warm applause again.